Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Direct Interior Layering with Composite and Clinical Guidelines. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Serhat Koken, whose aim during this presentation will be to discuss how the rapid innovation of composite material in the last decade and the availability of various types of composites has given today's clinician a very convenient and cost-effective tool for their practice. Dr. Koken graduated from Marmara School of Dentistry in 1998. Since 2001, he has been practicing general dentistry at his private clinic in Istanbul. Over the years, Dr. Koken focused on direct composite resin applications and dental photography and presented at national meetings on both the technical and artistic aspects of interior direct resin restorations. He has also given several local hands-on courses on composite resin artistry. Serhat Koken is a co-founder of Instant Composite and Turquoise Study Club and is an active member of the Turkish Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry and Kalkidin Advanced Dental Study Group. We'd like to thank Dr. Koken for being with us today and DT Study Club for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture as they will be addressed by Dr. Koken at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Serhat Koken. Hello, welcome to my webinar. Uh, I'd like to say uh, uh, good evening to... <laughs> as uh, Javier Tapa did yes, uh, last lecture. Good evening to where uh, Asia, good afternoon Europe, and good morning to uh, America. And uh, I'm talking to you from Istanbul, Turkey. And this will be a lecture about anterior composite restorations and color perception. And I'd like to talk about uh, composite, uh, planning my composite restorations. I'd like to talk about Layering, I'd like to talk about um, finishing and polishing these uh, composite restorations. To have some, uh, we, uh, we, we might have problems uh, while we are doing especially composite in anterior region. And uh, we have some guidelines uh, with me and my friends. And I'm generally using these guidelines. Today, I'd like to show you my guidelines with you. And uh, here you'll see the topics here. These clinical guidelines for color perception are really useful uh, in my daily practice because uh, they are just five in number. And uh, the first one is morphology. So what I want to say about morphology is for uh, morphology is the most essential thing while doing anterior restorations, not only composite for uh, any type of uh, anterior restorations, but uh, uh, I define it uh, and I visualize it better with my photography and uh, to have a bit better photography is not only enough. I need to know lots of things about illumination. Here you'll see some slides uh, just telling about photography and illumination. Uh, but first, uh, first of all, I would like to show you this slide. This is very interesting for me. I've seen uh, the first uh, photo ever taken by a human being on internet and here you see it's from 1826, very early, but it took only seven hours to have it. But today in our clinic uh, work, uh, we can have a digital photograph even less than a second. So uh, this is my first photo, uh, one of my first photos digitally uh, in my clinic in 2005. And you see one of my last photos in 2015. You see there's a huge difference even in my photography. So I'd like to show about some secrets uh, or these, these are not the secrets, but they should be known by clinicians to have good photos. Uh, if you want to have a good photo like this, uh, I think we should use a, a macro lens. But Basically, having a micro flash uh, may cause some problems because when we want to uh, increase depth of field, uh, we need to have a good illumination as well. So basically, we have two types of illumination device. Uh, one is called ring and the other is named twin. Uh, ring, as you see, is a, a two type. Uh, the, 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 the flashes are located very closely to um, lens, but uh, on twin, it's uh, easy to uh, separate them and you can move them away from uh, lens and you can have 
different uh, angulations in different directions. So that makes our uh, photography better. So uh, you will see a clinical example of a ring and twin flash difference. And here you see on the left part a ring uh, example showing really uh, because of the placement of the uh, flash uh, units uh, very close to uh, lens. So you see a very uh, strong reflection over centrals and uh, lateral incisors uh, that will uh, make a problem to visualize the uh, texture of it. But on the twin one, uh, you see uh, the reflection is uh, even uh, less than it and uh, the uh, line angles are visualized better. And uh, what else? We can evaluate the texture and even on the gingival tissue here you see are, uh, can be, uh, these tissues can be examined, examined better. So uh, another clinical example, this is the same uh, to upper right and left cent central incisors. And uh, here you see uh, left one is ring again and the right one is twin. I want to point out that the reflection area again on the upper left one and uh, even uh, there is a restoration on the ring one and the twin one. Uh, it looks better on the twin uh, image, but uh, and uh, line angles are visualized better. Uh, that's a trick that why most imp uh, why uh, the clinicians uh, are choosing twin uh, in anterior region. Even the same restoration looks better with the twin uh, illumination. Uh, another example uh, with the ring flash uh, that we can use for shade selection uh, for uh, ceramic restorations. Uh, and uh, it's a good way to have a dialogue with uh, laboratory. Uh, and uh, to make it uh, better, uh, we can sometimes use uh, cross polarization. Uh, some, uh, we can use some polar polarization filters to have a different image uh, than uh, the original one. In this case, uh, if we use cross-polarization system, we can have a, a better, uh, uh, we, uh, we can have better photos in means of having less uh, reflection area on the uh, anterior region. Here you see on the right image, uh, the incisal halo, the texture, uh, not the texture, sorry, uh, the, Tissue underneath the enamel can be visualized without element, uh, can, be visual, uh, can be visualized easily by elimination of these reflections uh, on the surface. But uh, I will show you another picture. Uh, it can be used again for shade selection and uh, composite button triad technique. They can be even used. And uh, here we will see. My way that I don't use uh, these cross polarization filters to have shade selection in composite uh, anterior composite restorations. My way to have say, uh, correct shades is composite button try. Mostly, more than 90% of my case uh, are done with this way. But I use uh, not a ring flash. I generally, uh, maybe always, <laughs> I use. Uh, twin flash uh, to have the correct shade. So I will just show you a little, but in the uh, later uh, of this uh, lecture, I will, I will tell you more about it. Here you see what I do with this photography uh, to have uh, the chroma, to, uh, to select the chroma coming from dentin, I increase saturation and decrease brightness. And uh, what I do uh, to have the correct shade for enamel, uh, just black and white to see the value there. So uh, what happens clinically? Here you see uh, the desired shade is applied, uh, and then we can have a beautiful, uh, nice, uh, natural-looking restoration. Uh, what other thing uh, that we can do with the photography is to have a uh, texture-showing photo. Here I use just a single flash. Uh, in fact, it's a it's only uh, one uh, unit of twin flash. Uh, the other is not working. Just having it uh, facing towards the lens and uh, having an image like this is not that difficult, but uh, it works uh, easily. But uh, the angulation is the most important 
of this technique. Uh, once you start it, uh, you, you will be able to have a photo like this very uh, easily. And here you see another example of a uh, single flash again. And uh, what I've done here, a mesio incisal uh, restoration on upper right one, uh, showing one year recall and uh, showing the marginal integrity of the restoration or again in the mesio incisal angle of the upper right one. And uh, it's really useful to have a texture, uh, to weave the texture. And these texture photos are showing uh, us the marginal integrities, integrity of the restorations. And of course, we know the opalescence feature of the tooth structure and the composite restorations. Uh, photography can even visualize them. And uh, another example uh, that's showing uh, the placement of the uh, flash. And uh, by this way, uh, just uh, moving them away from the lens and uh, having, uh, it's not that difficult uh, to have a surface texture uh, showing the perikmatas and uh, the incisal structures uh, because it's a new emerging tooth and uh, we can ev uh, evaluate the translucency, we can evaluate the incisal hello uh, maybe we can we need a little bit uh, software, uh, a good photo editing program to uh, visualize these areas. Uh, I will show you some other uh, clinical examples showing uh, how I, we can use photography to visualize better. This is one sample, and here you see another uh, patient uh, showing some texture on the anterior incisors, and here is uh, one. Uh, three month recall of a composite restoration showing the marginal integrity, showing the line angles, uh, ridges and uh, grooves, and we can have lots of data. Uh, this is a restoration uh, uh, after three months. Uh, this photo is taken, as I told you earlier, uh, three months later, so we can uh, have uh, various uh, photos like this uh, in our clinic by using a uh, single flash uh, illumination. So morphology uh, is really essential to have good restoration, but uh, we need to find out some spatial, uh, spatial features of the tooth structure. If we keep them in our mind uh, from initial to the final finishing process, we can uh, creates our beautiful restorations. What are, what are the important points that need, we need to be uh, careful to define earlier? Our outlines, long axis, uh, and location of contact points, zenith points, line angles, uh, incisal embrasures, and emergence profile, and etc. As you see here, are the most important ones. But also, we shouldn't forget to uh, uh, we shouldn't uh, forget to have information about facial planes. Uh, while the especially central incisors are not a flat, uh, do not have a flat surface. They are they have curvature on it. And uh, also, one other thing that I want to mention here is uh, the morphology is not based on single tooth structure, but we should have harmony and this harmony can be better uh, visualized earlier with photography and after restoration they should be uh, kept in my in in our minds and uh, what else the incisal embrasures uh, should be uh, carefully uh, imagined and uh, should be carefully prepared after the restorations so secondly uh, the topics are chroma and value, uh, and uh, what we understand from, sorry, uh, what I understand and what we must understand from uh, chroma and value is we know muscle color system or muscle color space, hue is main color, chroma is saturation of that color, hue can be something like green, yellow, uh, blue, pink, any color, but uh, chroma is saturation of this any color. For example, saturation of blue, saturation of pink, 
And the values of this is the hardest issue to talk, talk about. It's brightness or whiteness of color. But uh, I will try to explain you uh, in the next slides. Here you see chroma. Uh, what uh, here I could tell is I think there is a uh, white paint or milk. Uh, we start dropping some red uh, paints on it. Uh, when we increase the amount of paint, uh, it means that the chroma is increasing. So chroma is saturation of color. Uh, with every drop of red uh, paint, uh, the chroma is increasing. And uh, what is value? Value is brightness or whiteness of color. It's very easy to tell, but uh, not easy to uh, explain with uh, dental structures uh, but uh, here I can show you some uh, two uh, I show you two uh, circles uh, these uh, two different uh, uh, yellowish co uh, colored pencils are circled but here you if I ask a question which one is high in value or not uh, yes we might uh, select but uh, e the easiest way here is just to have a black and white image of the same photo. So as you see, the upper one is high, high uh, more bright. So the whiteness is more there, more there. And the lower one is less. So we can talk about the value here easily. And these black and white images are very useful in the dental uh, composites or dan uh, dan uh, anterior composites. Here you see um, when we uh, combine uh, Hussel, Munsell's uh, color system with uh, dental structures, hue means uh, any color, but here it's A, B, C, or D. But uh, generally, as you see the uh, article uh, from Jordi Manoata and his friends, he defined uh, there again uh, more than 80% or almost 80% of teeth are in A shade. So we are lucky we are not talking about the other shades. So if we are talking A shade, so what's, what could be the chroma of uh, these A shades? So the number coming to adjacent to A are defining the chroma. So A4, A3 to A1 the chroma is going down. And uh, it means that the pigment uh, or the structure just giving the uh, color uh, to, uh, just giving the chroma to A shade uh, is decreasing from A4 to A1. So we can talk about that uh, the A1 is high in chroma and A4, part, sorry, A1 is less in chroma and A4 is high in chroma, we call it hyperchromatic or chromatic uh, shade. But what happens uh, when we talk about uh, value? Uh, but uh, this time uh, A1 is high in value because it's more bright, it's more white, uh, whitish, but uh, A4 is less. So this time it's not uh, going, uh, it, this time it's not going high. Uh, from A1 to A4. This time uh, A1 is high, A4 is low in value, so it's indirectly proportional. With, uh, we can say chroma and value are indirectly proportional. It's very uh, useful knowledge. Uh, and uh, to define it uh, or to show it uh, better, maybe these uh, black and white image can show us that Enamel uh, is, uh, can show us the difference of A1 on A4 shade easily. Uh, and here you see the value is going down, the brightness is going down from A1 to A4. And one thing that I want to mention here, if we are talking about chroma, uh, uh, we shouldn't forget that dentin is uh, the source that's giving the chroma to the to composite restorations. But when we are uh, talking about enamel, enamel is the source which is giving value. So if you are creating a uh, composite restoration, especially in class four, a big class four restorations, uh, 
uh, whenever we are building uh, the whenever we are layering the uh, composites we should keep in my our minds that we are giving chroma to the restoration with layering dentin so we cannot uh, estimate the f f value by layering dentin so what we do we uh, layer enamel over it and we define the value by layering this enamel shade and the third topic here is mamelon design and uh, what is mamelon design mamelon design is the dentin uh, layer uh, on incisal one third so planning uh, or planning this uh, lobes, dentin lobes in incisal one third will give us the future uh, design of the incisal uh, uh, incisal part of restoration. So if we layer high uh, levels of dentin here and a very less uh, enamel, so the incisal uh, part will be not that translucent. So if you want to increase the translucency uh, or if you want to give some uh, if you want to have uh, if you want to increase the translucency so we should keep our mind that we should place there some enamel more or we should um, add some spe specific uh, enamel shades like opalescent ones uh, to incisal one third to have an incisal halo or to have a translucency there. But uh, if we keep them shorter, uh, these dental lobes, then, then the incisal edge will be more translucent. Or if we keep them just uh, till the uh, end of the incisal edge, so it will be more opaque. So planning uh, the, the design of uh, dentin in incisal one third will uh, define our uh, restoration earlier than layering the enamel uh, shape. So here you see an image and uh, just enhancing the uh, enhancing the image with a photo editing program we can find out that the translucency is uh, located mostly in incisal one third and proximally pro proximal of the tooth structure. Here you see another image and uh, by again enhancing it and in this image we can see the translucent areas are on incisal one third and the proximal uh, parts of the tooth but uh, what i want to mention here is the translucency uh, the term translucent is the term between uh, is uh, opaque and trans it's not opaque it's not transparent uh, transparent but uh, it's translucent. It allows the passage of light, but uh, when we talk about opaque, it's not allowing uh, the passage of light. But when we are talking about transparent, it's like glass fully uh, allowing the light transmission. So translucency can be any degree. It could be something like an opaque uh, or something like a transparent, uh, very close uh, to a transparent uh, one, but uh, uh, it, we can uh, have different translucencies uh, in different patients or different parts of the tooth, but mostly uh, enamel, enamel uh, uh, incisal one third are mo uh, more translucent uh, that we can say it. And uh, there are some differences uh, between the young and old uh, uh, tooth uh, or old patients. Mostly, uh, the, the biggest difference is the thickness of enamel. Uh, because uh, of its thickness, uh, the, uh, it, has high in, it is high in value, and be maybe because of the texture uh, also. But what happens uh, when the tooth is getting old? Uh, the uh, thickness of enamel is reduced, so it allows us to visualize the Dentin and this dentin is more sclerotic and it allows us to visualize deeper parts. So because of the hyperchromatic dentin after age and because of the less uh, thickness of enamel, uh, it looks uh, hyperchromatic and 
less in value. And uh, also we can use uh, photo editing programs uh, to visualize the difference uh, and we can uh, see in size uh, one third uh, in means of translucency, especially in young patients easily. Uh, and we can guess uh, the placement of these dental lobes uh, better uh, in these uh, uh, photographs. Uh, what I do here, I increase saturation and decrease brightness uh, to visualize the incisal one-third uh, uh, how can I say, in, uh, incisal one-third uh, property of the incisal hello. I mean, here you see uh, a natural tooth and then composite tooth and uh, the difference uh, is here we cannot mimic enamel thickness in uh, composite ones because uh, if we try to increase the thickness of enamel it won't uh, let us to visualize the chroma coming from dentin so uh, it's not always to mimic the nature uh, this slide is from Jordi Manoata from his book layers and uh, it's just to define that uh, the thickness is uh, the thickness, especially in middle uh, one third of tooth uh, anterior composite restorations, should be kept around 0 0.5 or maybe a little bit more, little bit more. And uh, I would like sh to show you a diagram showing what happens when we have a fractured tooth and how we can uh, make a restoration. Uh, we mainly love uh, that the palatal shell is very useful, uh, which we can have from a silicon index, uh, or we, we get a silicon index, sure, from a wax up or a mock up. And then uh, we layer a palatal shell. And this palatal shell uh, is uh, very thin, uh, almost 0 0.3 millimeter in thickness. And over then, over it, we play a layer opaque dentin and dentin, but some uh, dentin uh, shades of some uh, companies are enough opaque, or uh, we do not use to use we, we do not use to have uh, an opaque dentin underneath dentin. But uh, anyway, uh, if we are, we need to increase the opacity of dentin, we apply this opaque layer under it. And then what we do, we add a, an enamel layer over these dentin. So here you see a close-up image showing uh, the layers here and the palatal shell. Uh, let me show you. Here you see 0. Point, uh, pardon, uh, 0.3 millimeters uh, palatal shell. And then over it, I layer an opaque dentin. And then just leaving a space here, 0 0.5 millimeters enamel dentin and layering my dentin. This uh, incise is a one third uh, anatomy. Incise of one third translucency is achieved by layering these uh, dentin lobes. So these uh, in, uh, hyper, uh, hyper saturated and uh, low bright uh, photos will show us the placement of natural uh, mamelons there. So we uh, place our composite uh, dentin as we see from the photographs. So I will show you another photograph. Uh, here you see sagittal uh, plan uh, that uh, I've written here some points. Thanks. OK, sorry. Yes. Uh, this is the opaque dentin, but in some uh, composites, uh, we do not have uh, the, we do not need to use opaque dentin because they are enough uh, in opacity. But if we use this uh, opaque dentin, I would like to show you that we can increase these triangle in area or in dimensions in 3D. So we can increase the opacity, but uh, this E point is certain. So to keep a, a 0 0.5 millimeter in thickness enamel, we do not change this E point, but uh, this B point, yes, it can be changed, but this is uh, what we can do uh, with this C point. We, if we need to uh, layer more than thin, 
tilde incisal edge. We just uh, move this one to more incisal, or we just uh, move it to coronally to have a more translucent area on the incisal one third. What else we can add here? We can use an opalescent uh, composite shade to have more uh, opalescence effect, uh, opalescence, uh, opalescence structure on the final restoration. This could be the things that we can do uh, to modify our plan. Here, another factor that's uh, important uh, while we are layering the compos uh, enamel shades, what happens here? If we increase the thickness over than 0 0.5, as I showed you in the previous uh, diagram, uh, if we keep it uh, 0 0.5, it's uh, quite good. But what happens if we go one millimeter or two, we cannot see the layer under it. So if you want to see a3 shade under our enamel, we won't be able to see A3, or we will see something completely different than A3. We won't have a chroma coming from uh, under the enamel shade. So just to keep it less, uh, or not less, uh, just something like 0.5 millimeters, especially in the middle one third of tooth, uh, is really essential to have a natural looking tooth structure. And other thing that we not we should we should be uh, careful is, uh, or we should be uh, uh, we should have a we should have some knowledge about this is uh, the texture of the enamel shade. Uh, if our restoration uh, is very uh, glossy, it shows the chroma underneath, and uh, if it's a little bit uh, textured. So we are not able to see uh, while uh, able see we are not able to see the chroma coming from the dentin. So having a textured or having a glossy surface of uh, enamel uh, makes a difference to visualize the chroma underneath the enamel. So in the final steps of our restoration, if we find out our restoration is little bit uh, low in value, we should try to give some texture to the surface to increase the value, or if we find it a little bit high in value, so we can make a more glossy surface or a texture to have an, uh, to make it visual, uh, to make it seen. I mean, uh, the chroma coming from dentin can be seen if we have uh, this glossy texture and uh, we can decrease the value of the restoration. So you will see some clinical examples of uh, me of mine, and uh, here you see incisal uh, one third uh, of my uh, restoration, and uh, this will result uh, the final image uh, in means of incisal hello, in means of translucency, because over these dentin will be completely layered with enamel. So what will uh, happen after this? All uh, the enamel shades will give some uh, value and will give some translucency and uh, the thickness of the enamel will allow me to visualize the dentin underneath. So uh, 3D, uh, if we think uh, pro, uh, buccal palatinal thickness of these uh, dentin lobes, if they are not uh, enough uh, to give uh, a, a uh, to give a desired uh, text, uh, thickness for enamel, maybe uh, because of a very uh, thick enamel, we cannot be able to see these dentin lobes. Of if we overlayer these dentins, uh, we will see finally uh, chroma coming from the dentin, and we, it won't look natural. So, just uh, we are doing everything while we are doing the dent uh, while we are layering the dentin uh, shade. This is another clinical example. And this is uh, a different one because uh, I do not use, I didn't use a palatal shell here. I just layer my uh, opaque dentin and then dentin and having these three lobes. And just thinking in my mind that uh, I, if I uh, thinking in my mind that uh, to layer 
this amount of uh, enamel over these dentin will look uh, will uh, result a, a final restoration which will be similar to the adjacent one but uh, the palatal shell uh, technique is more easier for uh, to have a, a pre-estimated uh, enamel layer the last uh, topic of these guidelines are is uh, effects uh, but these are really optional uh, we might see some white spots and uh, cervical stains but we might uh, we may reproduce the white spots but uh, mostly we do not need to re reproduce cervical stains but these could be these uh, could be some effects uh, and uh, we might see some horizontal lines, horizontal white lines or white clothings. Uh, but uh, I just uh, do a very small uh, effect on my restorations. Uh, and these uh, effects are not easy. And uh, I must say that it's optional. So we keep it in the last place. So let's talk about shade selection. And here you'll see some. Uh, here you'll see what I do, and uh, to have correct shades in my clinic workflow, daily workflow, uh, I use composite button try. And uh, here you see uh, some uh, composite buttons. Uh, the rules are uh, having a 1.5 millimeter uh, thickness and need to polymerize it uh, perfectly, but need to be very fast. Uh, prior to everything, I place these composite buttons and uh, just uh, polymerize and get a very fast photo, because if we wait or if we are a little bit late, we won't have uh, enough, uh, we won't have uh, the correct uh, shade, because uh, there is a risk of uh, losing water, losing uh, teeth will be hydrated, so the chalk appearance of uh, enamel will appear. So, uh, in order to have uh, teeth hydrated, we should be very fast. Uh, maybe it should be all done in less than two minutes, but uh, uh, the enamel thickness should be around 1.5. Uh, if we keep it less, so we won't get the correct shade. This is the uh, result of the restoration. And uh, here you see what I do. Uh, the, uh, the middle line, uh, the, the buttons are dentin and they are placed, as, uh, as you see, in the middle one third. So to define the chroma coming from uh, dentin, the best place is the middle one third. And what I uh, try uh, here, increasing saturation and decreasing brightness, chroma can be easily uh, seen and uh, the difference can be easily detected. So uh, the correct shade is uh, selected by this way, in means of dentin. But uh, when we are talking enamel, uh, because mostly the incisal vant third is uh, composed of enamel, so the image is turned into black and white and uh, the correct value and the correct shade is selected in this way. So uh, the last thing that we do after we layer and we complete the layer and polymerize our uh, composites, we do finishing and polishing. And here you see uh, we start uh, with uh, a rotary instrument, but sometimes, uh, or I can say, I sometimes use these uh, rotary instruments, but uh, because uh, we cannot control the strength of this uh, uh, instrument, uh, we can uh, have uh, we can lose the place of uh, the line angles, and we can uh, have some we can uh, narrow the size of the tooth, or we can uh, remove some incisal uh, angles of the to uh, composite restoration. So uh, it's better to use uh, a abrasive strip instead of these uh, rotary instruments. And the uh, thing that we, I do to have a texture, uh, I use uh, 75 micron grease sites 
uh, diamond coated uh, burr, uh, which uh, will have some, uh, which will uh, form here some texture. But uh, it's uh, why I'm using uh, this blue band, uh, 75 micron grid size dim diamond coated burr, because uh, it's easy to remove this uh, scratch. Uh, the green or the black ones are not that easy. And then after uh, this, I, to remove the scratch coming from the uh, burr, I use uh, brownies uh, that we were using in amalgam restorations or some uh, hard rubbers like uh, Shofa Vanglos uh, with ab abundant water spray. Uh, and uh, it's around 10,000 RPM to have uh, to smooth these scratch coming from the burr. And then uh, I keep on, I start my polishing with the diamond uh, polish uh, with the goat hair disc. And here you see the order from uh, start with three micron to and finish with one micron. But in my clinic, they, they, in my daily workflow, I just use one micron diamond polish and uh, it even works with the goat hair. And you see uh, later, uh, Right after uh, goat hair disc, I use a felt disc, which is uh, the perfect thing to have a glossy surface and use it. Uh, normally, uh, they recommend us to use uh, aluminum oxide, but uh, I use, uh, again, diamond uh, polish uh, for it. Uh, we can even use that one. But uh, if, if we are something like 1000 RPM, uh, yes, we can uh, use it without water, but whenever the speed is high, we should use abundant water spray to not to have uh, heat on the tooth structure. You see the final image after this finishing and polishing process. Uh, here you will see some clinical uh, examples of uh, anterior composite restorations. Uh, upper left one, uh, a fractured tooth, a very young patient. And uh, here you see what I have uh, after but composite button try. Uh, after, uh, it's very, uh, it should, we should be very quick and uh, it, it shouldn't be more than two minutes to have this photograph. And, but these photographs are not that enough uh, to evaluate the correct shades. So what we should use uh, to evaluate the dentin and enamel shades. Again, as you see here, increasing the contrast and decreasing the brightness. So uh, this effect will give us ideas about the dentin, not the enamel, because uh, in this way, we can select the correct shade. Here I've selected A1 uh, from Genial, but uh, why? not A2, because uh, this patient is young. And uh, if you comp uh, change the contrast, if you increase the contrast, uh, you'll see some areas which are close to A1 shade, not A2. And that's the reason that I selected A1 shade. And here you see black and white image to visualize the value, visualize uh, to uh, to select the correct enamel shade, uh, I used uh, black and white image. And here you see A1 is more uh, similar to the value of uh, the adjacent tooth. So I, and even uh, the patient is a very young in age. So it's called junior enamel. So that's why I selected this shade. So what happens after this uh, selection? Uh, this is the isolation photo. Uh, the, Rubber dam is inversed uh, to have uh, less uh, blood or um, any uh, fluid coming from the gingival area. And then preparation. And here you see a bevel, which is half chamfer. And then uh, to protect the adjacent to, from etching and adhesive uh, materials, uh, a Teflon tape is used and I just layer opaque A2 over it uh, to have uh, an opacity here to block out the margin, uh, a to block out a grayish line here. 
if our dentin is not that opaque, uh, in if if we know that uh, earlier, so adding this opaque layer underneath the dentin uh, will immediately stop this gray line, which is a real problem for most of us in our uh, clinical uh, workflows. And so I layered uh, opaque dentin and over then, over this opaque uh, layer, I layered my dentin. So here you see, again, these uh, three lobes of dentin, some scratch uh, made by a probe or elan fissura. And then uh, I used a translucent enamel uh, to give more uh, translucent area incisally and add some white tints uh, incisally uh, to have a natural appearance. And then I layered my enamel. So what happened here, uh, layering it, uh, layering enamel correctly uh, will make the finishing process easily and uh, I will have a uh, I won't have difficulties to keep these transitional lines because uh, if I do not layer them correctly, if these are not uh, these areas are not created with enamel, so I will never have a translation line like this in my restoration. And here you see after polishing, and here you see the to uh, re the restoration after rubber dam removal. So single flash photo showing me a good marginal integration with some transition lines and uh, ridges and ridges here and the grooves are easily seen with the single photo. This is another uh, case, uh, a very young patient again, something like 16 year in old in age. Uh, and here you see a close-up image. And I want to point out here that there is a need of uh, translucent uh, and opalescent area here. And here you'll see uh, photos showing the, there is a need to create uh, facial lines. And here you see the composite button try again. But this time, this case is done with a new material, one of uh, maybe second case with Essentia. And uh, I know that with Essentia, there is, an, there is no need for opaque layer under dentin. So that I know that the opacity of Essentia is enough uh, to block out this grayish line and uh, to, uh, not to cause any gray restoration over it. So I know that it will be enough, but uh, I layered this, uh, uh, composite uh, restoration uh, with just uh, two uh, dentin mess maybe uh, and additionally one opalescent layer and uh, in essentia there are mainly three dentin shades one is dark medium medium and light dentin so as you see with this hyper contrast and uh, decreased brightness uh, photo uh, it's so easy to select the correct shade cause uh, none of uh, them, uh, just only medium is the correct shade here. And uh, what happens when I do select the enamel shade? I just have two chances because these are the only five shades of Essentia. So it's easy to select the correct shade. And here you see because of the patient is young and it looks more better with light enamel. So I used medium dentin and light enamel. So you will see what will happen after layering. You will see a mo composite mock-up. Just uh, use uh, the medium dentin and light enamel. And patient loved the uh, result, but uh, I told him uh, that I will have a silicon index from it. And then uh, this is the photo of silicon index. And uh, just having the palatal uh, uh, reference from the uh, temporary restoration. In fact, it's not a temporary it's, I just layer it without any etching and bonding procedure. And otherwise, it's not easy to remove uh, without giving harm to the, uh, to the structure. 
and then have uh, an isolation and here you see uh, it looks like even a final restoration but it's not i removed the uh, mock-up material and uh, uh, this is my preparation and then etching and light a uh, palatal shell uh, again i i played uh, uh, again i used a uh, light enamel uh, to have palatal shell and then layered my dentin you see my dentin lobes but uh, uh, as we know, prior to our restoration, uh, the translucency, there was a need of translucency and even opalescency there. So uh, I layered my opalescent modifier from Essentia to increase the opalescence here and uh, to increase also the translucency. And here you see after enamel layering, light enamel, and this is the copy paste of upper left, uh, right one and showing that i need a minimal reduction to have the correct outlines and then start this uh, fin uh, finishing uh, and then this is the final image so need to a little bit uh, careful about the uh, correct texture uh, the patient came uh, one uh, week later, and this is the one week recall of the case, uh, showing uh, correct line angles, showing good incisal hello, showing opalescence there, opalescence there, and it was uh, fair enough uh, for me and for the patient. And this is an, a case referred from a pediatric dentist of mine, and uh, she immediately uh, reattach this fractured part and uh, just made a temporary restoration on upper left one. Uh, you see palatal view, and then uh, again these five shades of essentia: three dentin in middle one third and two enamel in incisal one third. And uh, increasing contrast shows me that uh, I should not use dark dentin it's very obvious and light dentin yes it's again uh, i should use medium dentin and then what happens if i turn the image into black and white uh, just uh, easy to understand this light enamel uh, should be used there so if you have less uh, shades so it's easier to select the correct ones here you see what happens after light enamel uh, palatal shell so I had made a preparation here and uh, I, my plan is just to fill this area with a huge volume of dentin cause the tooth is opaque and even I need to reproduce a whitish area on measly in incisal edge. So this is what happens after the huge dentin layer and whitish area with the white uh, intensive of uh, GC. Here you see uh, enamel uh, layer with light enamel. And then uh, I'll start my finishing. And then this is the image, uh, fi uh, final image in the same day, showing that I made something similar translucency on the incisal area. And uh, there is no uh, grayish line or uh, the translucency seems normal. This is a single flash photo that uh, my aim was to create some ridges and grooves here and showing some texture on photos. And uh, you will see here another photo uh, showing the showing from incisal edge. Uh, these uh, ridges and grooves are easily seen. And this is one week recall. And uh, here you see a little bit close up. Uh, the chroma and value looks nice and there is no grayish line. And uh, I think uh, it, it's, it's fine, but this is one month recall of the same patient. It's even better. 
the recessed uh, gingiva because of the rubber dam is uh, the problem they are solved and good uh, proximal integration of two central incisors and this is another image showing the texture is still there because uh, I was really curious about uh, not curious I was really careful about uh, the keeping the texture till the end of the polishing process even after one month the texture is there and this is the final case that I want to present you today is with Essentia again the patient has some complaints about the marginal uh, discolorization but uh, in fact uh, these angled photos shows uh, some uh, all problems uh, uh, better uh, so I will show you what I've done here uh, first a removal of the old restoration carefully not to remove uh, uh, some uh, extra uh, tooth structure and then acid etching and uh, washing with water spray and you see the edge surface and uh, micro brush is uh, just applied and uh, just showing you here one bristle of micro brush uh, after curing the uh, ab adhesive material uh, after curing the bonding material sorry and then uh, a little piece of uh, light enamel is uh, placed there and with an instrument it can be uh, we can create a smooth surface but you will see what will happen uh, this surface is not uh, good enough uh, to have easy finishing and polishing so I applied uh, I used a um, probe but uh, or I, I may use an LM fissure here to make surface more flat but uh, I used instead of this uh, uh, this time I used a sable brush from uh, I used this time again a sable brush from GC, the uh, largest brush. And uh, just to have a texture like that, just immediately cured after I remove, uh, I, left, I left my uh, brush on the surface, left my brush from the surface. And I used a heavy rubber, uh, or I may use a Brovni or Shofa Van Gloss on the surface with abundant water spray and uh, had that texture like that but it was not uh, that glossy uh, like uh, upper right one uh, so what I did here is uh, I used a diamond uh, polish of GC uh, but this time uh, I used a different instrument but uh, the speed is was very low uh, just to keep the texture on the surface and uh, this tiny amount of uh, polish material is enough to have this uh, to have this uh, uh, to have this polish uh, and but the polish is not enough uh, if we work hard uh, with the uh, goat hair or this pink brush so we need to improve it with a felt disc here you see what happens after the felt is uh, it's really glossy and uh, the glossiness is uh, similar to the upper right one as you see here and this is the final image after rubber dam removal and you will see here the difference uh, the you will see here before and after photo uh, I could have this uh, case with a uh, frontal view of image but it wouldn't show the difference of the surface glossiness or surface texture created by the instruments uh, with the rotary instruments uh, so that's why I prefer to have uh, an angled view for this restoration so this is uh, the end of the visual part but you may please uh, ask your questions thanks for your watching uh, yes, uh, you may not use bouncers uh, for the uh, 
composite restorations or anterior region. But uh, whenever uh, you need to increase uh, the, uh, whenever you need to soften the uh, flash, or if you want to uh, decrease the amount of the light reflecting from the uh, tooth structure, or if you want to have more smooth surface uh, with your photography, you then bouncers are really nice. Uh, which camera should be used? Uh, I, uh, I'm using uh, a very basic uh, DSLR camera. Uh, any camera, but with a macro lens uh, should be the correct answer and a good illumination here. Uh, uh, if you are asking your question about uh, bonding, quest, uh, bond, bond, pardon me, certain. Uh, my my protocol is just to obey the prof, uh, pro, 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 product uh, pro, product uh, manual. So just to uh, apply the protocol that's given with the company, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, uh, anyone will work uh, if they are uh, if you know in the market but uh, the best thing that we should do is uh, isolation uh, and uh, we should keep the times uh, and uh, we should be uh, careful about the uh, procedure on behalf of the dentin and If you are, uh, your question about the things changing about Hukuroma to composite restorations, yes, the, not only tooth structure, but the composite materials are aging. So uh, I, I believe that uh, the current materials from all companies can, uh, stand, uh, the, uh, can stand these problems more than five or seven years, maybe more than 10. Uh, what happens, uh, if we do not need to increase the thickness less than 0 0.5. Uh, the best thing is to have a less value enamel because uh, um, the design of the value is given with enamel. So whenever we increase, decrease the thickness zero than, uh, less than uh, 0 0.5, uh, we will have other problems, the chroma coming from the Xanthine, so it wouldn't look natural. Uh, same question, sorry. <laughs> After. Uh, how I do evaluate the correct thickness? Uh, uh, as you have seen, I showed a diagram. Uh, so the thickness of enamel is certain in some points of the restorations till the incisal of the uh, till the incisal one third of the restoration. So uh, some there are some instruments like Elam Misura, but uh, you do not have to use them always. Uh, just to be careful about the thickness, just. Uh, to evaluate the thickness of dentin by having a mirror, uh, just hand mirror, uh, just using a mirror from the, uh, just having some uh, image from occlusal, uh, just we could use occlusal image to evaluate the thickness of uh, enamel, uh, dentin, uh, if it's the way that I do, but uh, uh, you will get used to it uh, if you use uh, these occlusal photos. Uh, uh, what program I use uh, with comp uh, to evaluate these photos? Uh, the I I was using uh, uh, Picasso uh, 
from Google, uh, you can find uh, Picasso tree. Uh, it's a shareware uh, program. It's nice to use it, or you can use uh, uh, PowerPoint or Keynote also. How can we catch the right uh, chroma in something? Uh, the easiest thing to catch the right chroma is uh, to increase the saturation and uh, decrease the brightness and having an image with composite buttons, uh, it's uh, really working, Every, uh, all, it's always working. And uh, what should be the thickness of op opaque? Uh, it depends on the opacity of your opaque dentin, uh, but uh, uh, you should get used to your uh, composite, uh, this uh, opaque material uh, to have the correct thickness. Do you recommend? And yes, uh, vetting agent. These are not a vetting agents, uh, especially what I use here is a composite uh, primer. Uh, it's not the primer of the bonding. Uh, this, uh, it's not the composite. Uh, it, it's composite primer from GC, but it's not the primer of uh, HR rinse systems. It's something different. It's just uh, only uh, resin, and uh, just I just wet my brush, and uh, if it's that wet, uh, it will not work that uh, better. So just a little bit. Uh, I just. Uh, remove the excess uh, material over my brush on my brush uh, sorry what uh... okay uh, what do you uh, do for hiding the differential line between uh, you mean the marking uh, the line uh, the, the grayish line in between uh, composite and uh, tooth structure yes because uh, it appears because there is the, the the result structure will be less in opacity than the natural one so if we can keep the op uh, opacity uh, similar to the original tooth structure there will be no grayish uh, line or a gray gray stru structure so uh, we should be sure about the gray, uh, we should be sure about the opacity of the dentin that we are using. If our dentin is not that opaque, so we should use an opaque layer on it, under it, or if we layer uh, an enamel shade, which is more than 0 0.5 in, in uh, middle one third, it will result a gray line, grayish line there. Um, Uh, if the patient uh, has a discolored uh, margin of the old restoration, uh, what I do, because uh, I have some old restorations uh, and they, the patients come to me uh, and uh, because of some marginal problems, I just uh, remove them with a very uh, soft uh, rubber and uh, Maybe uh, it works, but if it doesn't work, I need to remove uh, these uh, uh, problem areas and then re-layer uh, the enamel there again. Uh, or uh, maybe I need to remove all the restoration, but generally just uh, removing some uh, margins there would work. Uh, you're asking me how many hours I'm spending for the case. Yes, uh, maybe two years before I was spending lots of time, uh, but now uh, it, it's easier to finish uh, these restorations. Uh, yes, uh, four hours is really wrong, uh, really long time, but uh, uh, both patients uh, and uh, we can be very tired of it so uh, I just uh, sometimes I do 
to to uh, then uh, to uh, I restore only two to and uh, uh, call the patient again to do the other restorations later. Did you? Uh, sorry, did not like to use rotor disc. Uh, with a rotary disc, uh, I do not use uh, a paste uh, with them, because uh, pastes are generally used with uh, uh, polishing tools, not with finishing tools, because I use uh, these uh, rotary discs or rotary... Uh, I use these rotary discs just to finish the surf, uh, finish the restoration. And since enamel uh, years of time should be modified. No, uh, if the enamel years of time should we modify the thickness layer of enamel dentin with the age of time? No, um, because uh, whenever I place a uh, enamel shade uh, over dentin, uh, I always try to keep it around 0 0.5 uh, I uh, change uh, the chroma of the restoration by changing the dentin underneath the enamel uh, and if I need to reduce the value if I need to have a low value restoration I use a low value uh, enamel shade I think this is the final question so any more questions yes sir uh, okay. Uh, using light cure uh, calcium hydrox hydroxide paste. Uh, uh, I do not use uh, this calcium hydro hydroxide paste. Uh, sorry, uh, but uh, it should be very. Uh, thin, uh, so why uh, I don't think that it will change the opacity of or uh, change the light properties of the restoration. So thank you for watching my webinar, and uh, I would like to thank you all and thank you all my friends all around the world. Thank you very much, Dr. Kirken, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We'd also like to thank DT Study Club for making this online course possible. And thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The C quiz is now available online on the course page, and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Kirken may be submitted directly on the website, on the courses page, under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions, and Dr. Kirken will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the DT Study Club educational platform, www.dtstudyclub.com, and keep an eye out for a growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care, and goodbye.